This lesson is adapted from an article by Gabriella Veneziano, who's one of the founders of string theory and one of the first to apply string theory to black holes and cosmology. Was the Big Bang really the beginning of time? Or did the universe exist before then? Such a question seemed almost blasphemous only decades ago. Most cosmologists insisted that it made no sense, that to contemplate a time before the Big Bang was like asking for directions to a place north of the North Pole. But developments in theoretical physics, especially the rise of string theory, have changed their perspective. The pre-Bang universe has actually become a frontier of cosmology. And the new willingness to consider what might have happened before the Big Bang is the latest swing of an intellectual pendulum that's been rocking back and forth for millennia. In one form or another, the issue of the ultimate beginning has engaged philosophers and theologians in nearly every culture. It's entwined with a grand set of concerns, one famously encapsulated in an 1897 painting by Paul Gauguin titled, Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? The piece depicts the cycle of birth, life, and death, the origin, identity, and destiny for each individual. And these personal concerns connect directly to cosmic ones. We can trace our own lineage back through the generations. Um, in fact, now scientists can trace our lineage through the first land animal ancestors to early forms of life, to proto-life, uh, to the elements that were synthesized in the primordial universe, to the amorphous energy deposited in space even before that. Does our family tree extend forever backward, or do its roots terminate? Is the cosmos as impermanent as we are? The ancient Greeks debated the origin of time fiercely. Taking the no-beginning side, Aristotle invoked the principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. If the universe could never have gone from nothingness to somethingness, it must always have existed. For this and other reasons, time must stretch eternally into the past and into the future. Christian theologians tended to take the opposite point of view. Augustine contended that God exists outside of space and time, able to bring these constructs into existence as surely as he would forge other aspects of our world. When asked, what was God doing before he created the world, Augustine answered, since time itself is part of God's creation, there was simply no before. Einstein's general theory of relativity lent modern cosmologists to much the same conclusion. The theory holds that space and time are malleable. On the largest scales, space is naturally dynamic, expanding or contracting over time, carrying matter like driftwood on the tide. In the 1920s, Astronomers confirmed that our universe is expanding. Distant galaxies move apart from one another. One consequence of this, as physicists Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose proved in the 1960s, is that time cannot extend back indefinitely. As you play cosmic history backward in time, the galaxies all come together into a single infinitesimal point known as a singularity, almost as if they were descending into a black hole. Each galaxy or its precursor is squeezed down to zero size. Quantities such as density, temperature, space-time curvature all become infinite. The singularity is the ultimate cataclysm beyond which our cosmic ancestry cannot extend. The unavoidable singularity poses serious problems for cosmologists. For the cosmos to look broadly the same everywhere, as it does, some kind of communication had to pass among distant regions of space, somehow coordinating their properties. Yet the idea of such communication contradicts our standard understanding of cosmology. So consider what's happened over the past 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. The distance between galaxies has grown by a factor of about a thousand because the universe is expanding while the radius of the observable universe has grown even more by the factor of about 100,000, and that's because light is even faster than the expansion of the universe. So today, we see parts of the universe that we could not have seen 13.8 billion years ago. Indeed, this is the first time in cosmic history that light from the most distant galaxies has reached us in the Milky Way. Nevertheless, the properties of our Milky Way galaxy 
are basically the same as those of all the distant galaxies. It's like showing up at a party only to find you're wearing exactly the same outfit as a dozen of your friends. If just two of you were dressed the same, it might be explained away as a coincidence, but a dozen suggests that everyone coordinated their attire in advance. In cosmology, it's not clothes, but independent yet statistically identical patches of sky in what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the afterglow from the Big Bang. And the number isn't just a dozen, but rather tens of thousands. So one possible explanation is that all those regions of space were endowed at birth with identical properties. In other words, that the homogeneity is, is just a coincidence. However, physicists have come up with two other more natural ways out of this impasse. One is that the early universe was either much smaller or much older than is known from standard cosmology. Either, or actually both, they could act together, would have made intercommunication possible. So one explanation follows the first alternative. It postulates that the universe went through a period of accelerating expansion, known as inflation, early in its history. Before this phase, galaxies or their precursors were so closely packed that they could easily coordinate their properties. And then during inflation, they fell out of contact because light couldn't keep pace with the frenetic expansion. After inflation ended, the expansion began to decelerate, so galaxies gradually came back into one another's view. Physicists ascribe the inflationary spurt to the potential energy stored in a new quantum field, which is called the inflaton, which happened about 10 to the negative 35 second after the Big Bang. Unlike mass or kinetic energy, potential energy leads to gravitational repulsion. So rather than slowing down the expansion, as gravitation of ordinary matter would, the inflaton accelerated it. Proposed in 1981, inflation has explained a wide variety of observations with precision, but a number of possible theoretical problems remain, beginning with the questions of what exactly the inflaton was and what gave it such huge initial potential energy. So that's inflation. But another way to solve the puzzle follows the second alternative by just getting rid of the singularity. If time didn't begin at the Big Bang, and if a long era preceded the onset of the present cosmic expansion, then matter could have had plenty of time to arrange itself smoothly. And this has led some researchers to re-examine the reasoning that led them to infer a singularity in the first place. So one of the assumptions, that relativity theory is always valid, is questionable. Uh, close to the putative singularity, quantum effects must have been important, or even dominant. Standard relativity takes no account of such effects, so accepting the inevitability of the singularity amounts to trusting the theory really beyond reason. So to know what really happened, physicists need to include relativity in a quantum theory of gravity. This task has occupied theorists from Albert Einstein onward, but progress was almost zero until the mid-1980s. Today, two approaches stand out. One is called loop quantum gravity, and it retains Einstein's theory essentially intact, but it changes the procedure for implementing it in quantum mechanics. So practitioners of loop quantum gravity have taken great strides and achieved deep insights over the past several years, Still, their approach may not be enough to resolve the fundamental problems of quantizing gravity. So a second approach is string theory, and that is a, a really revolutionary modification of Einstein's theory. And this is what we'll focus on here, although proponents of loop quantum gravity reach some of the same conclusions. So string theory grew out of a model that physicist Gabriella Veneziano wrote in 1968 to describe the world of nuclear particles, which are you know, protons and neutrons, and their interactions. So despite a lot of initial excitement, the model was abandoned several years later in favor of another model called quantum chromodynamics, which describes nuclear particles in terms of more elementary constituents called quarks. Quarks are confined inside a proton or neutron as if they were tied together by elastic strings. In retrospect, the original string theory had captured these stringy aspects of the nuclear world. Um, only later it was revived as a candidate for combining general relativity and quantum theory. 
So the basic idea is that elementary particles are not point-like, but rather infinitely thin one-dimensional objects, and these are the strings. So the zoo we know of elementary particles, each of which has its own characteristic properties, those reflect the many possible vibration patterns of a string. So how can such a simple-minded theory, which is what Veneziano calls it, how can that describe the complicated world of particles and all their interactions? And so the answer can be found in what he dubbed quantum string magic. Once the rules of quantum mechanics are applied to a vibrating string, uh, just like a miniature violin string, except that the vibrations propagate along it at the speed of light, uh, once that happens, new properties appear. And all of these have profound implications for particle physics and for cosmology, so the smallest and the biggest. First, quantum strings have a finite size. If it weren't for quantum effects, a violin string could be cut in half, cut in half again, and so on, all the way down, finally becoming a massless, point-like particle. But Heisenberg's uncertainty principle eventually intrudes if you get small enough, and that prevents even the lightest strings from being sliced smaller than about 10 to the negative 34th meter. This irreducible quantum of length, uh, which is denoted as L sub S, is a new constant of nature introduced by string theory. It plays a crucial role in almost every aspect of string theory, and it puts a finite limit on quantities that otherwise could become either zero or infinite. So second, quantum strings may have angular momentum even if they lack mass. Now, in classical physics, angular momentum is a property of an object that rotates with respect to an axis. So the formula for angular momentum multiplies together velocity, mass, and distance from the axis. So hence, a massless object can't have angular momentum. But quantum fluctuations change the situation. A tiny string can acquire a certain amount of angular momentum even without having any mass. So this feature precisely matches the properties of all the fundamental forces, uh, such as the photon, which is for electromagnetism, and the graviton for gravity. Historically, angular momentum is what clued physicists in to the quantum gravitational implications of string theory. So third, quantum strings demand the existence of extra dimensions of space. Whereas a classical violin string will vibrate no matter what the properties of space and time are, a quantum string is more finicky. The equations describing the vibration become inconsistent unless space-time is either highly curved, uh, which is contrary to what we observe, or if it contains six additional spatial dimensions. Fourth, physical constants no longer have arbitrary fixed values. Instead, they occur in string theory as fields, rather like the electromagnetic field, that can adjust their values dynamically. So these fields may have taken different values in different cosmological epochs or in remote regions of space, and even today the physical constants that we know may vary by a small amount. And observing any variation would provide an enormous boost to string theory. One of the fields, called the dilaton, is the master key to string theory. It determines the overall strength of all interactions. The dilaton fascinates string theorists because its value can be reinterpreted as the size of an extra dimension of space, giving a grand total of 11 space-time dimensions. So finally, quantum strings have introduced physicists to some striking new symmetries of nature, known as dualities, uh, which alter our intuition for what happens when objects get extremely small. Typically, a short string is lighter than a long one, but if we attempt to squeeze down its size below the fundamental length of L sub S, then the string gets heavier again. So another form of symmetry is called T-duality, and it holds that small and large extra dimensions are equivalent. And this symmetry arises because strings can move in more complicated ways than point-like particles can. So consider a closed string, which is a loop, uh, located on a cylindrically shaped space whose circular cross-section represents one finite extra dimension. So besides vibrating, the string can either turn as a whole around the cylinder or wind around it, 
one or several times, like a rubber band wrapped up around a rolled up poster. So the energetic cost of these two states of the string depend on the size of the cylinder. The energy of winding is directly proportional to the cylinder radius. Larger cylinders require the string to stretch more as it wraps around, uh, and the winding contains more energy than they would on a smaller cylinder. The energy associated with moving around the circle, on the other hand, is inversely proportional to the radius. Larger cylinders allow for longer wavelengths, which have smaller frequencies, and that represents less energy than shorter wavelengths do. So if a large cylinder is substituted for a small one, the two states of motion can swap roles. Energies that had been produced by circular motion are instead produced by winding and vice versa. An outside observer notices only the energy levels, not the origin of those levels. So to the observer, the large and small radii are physically equivalent. So although this T duality is usually described in terms of cylindrical spaces, uh, where one dimension is finite, a variant of it applies also to our, our ordinary three dimensions, which appear to stretch on indefinitely. But we have to be careful when talking about the expansion of an infinite space. Its overall size can't change, it remains infinite. But it can still expand in the sense that bodies embedded within it, such as galaxies, can keep moving apart from one another. So the crucial variable is not the size of the space as a whole, but what's called its scale factor. And the scale factor is the distance, it, it describes how the distance between galaxies changes. Now, according to T-duality, universes with small scale factors are equivalent to ones with large scale factors. But no such symmetry is present in Einstein's equations. It emerges from the unification that string theory embodies, with the dilaton playing a central role. For years, string theorists thought that T-duality applied only to closed strings as opposed to open strings, which have loose ends and thus can't wind. But in the 1990s, scientists realized that T-duality did apply to open strings, uh, provided the switch between the large and small radii was accompanied by a change in the conditions at the endpoints of the string. And certain boundary conditions describe how those ends stay put. For instance, electrons may be strings whose ends can move around freely in three of the ten spatial dimensions, but are stuck within the other seven. Those three dimensions form a subspace known as a Dirichlet membrane, or a D-brain. In 1996, Peter Harava of the University of California at Berkeley and Edward Witten of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, proposed that our universe resides on such a brain. The partial mobility of electrons and other particles explains why we are unable to perceive the full ten-dimensional glory of space. All of the magic properties of quantum strings point in one direction. Strings abhor infinity. They can't collapse to an infinitesimal point, so they avoid the paradoxes that collapse entails. Their non-zero size and their novel symmetries set upper bounds to the physical quantities that increase without limit in conventional theories, and they set lower bounds to quantities that decrease. String theorists expect that when you play the history of the universe backward in time, the curvature of space-time starts to increase. But instead of going all the way back to infinity, which is the traditional Big Bang singularity, it eventually hits a maximum and then shrinks again. Before string theory, physicists were hard-pressed to imagine any mechanism that could so clearly eliminate the need for a singularity. Conditions near the zero time of the Big Bang were so extreme that no one yet knows how to solve the equations. But nevertheless, string theories have hazarded guesses about the, what we called the pre-Bang universe, and two popular models are still floating around. The first is known as the pre-Big Bang scenario, which Gabriella Veneziano and his colleagues began to develop in 1991. It combines T-duality with the better-known symmetry of time reversal, whereby the equations of physics work equally well when applied backward and forward in time. The combination gives rise to new possible cosmologies in which the universe, say, five seconds before the Big Bang expanded at the same pace as it did five seconds after the Big Bang. Yet the rate of change of the expansion was opposite at the two instances. 
if it was decelerating after the bang, it was accelerating before. So in short, the Big Bang may not have been the origin of the universe, but instead simply a, a violent transition from acceleration to deceleration. So the beauty of this picture is that it automatically incorporates the great insight of standard inflationary theory, namely that the universe had to undergo a period of acceleration to become so homogenous. In the standard theory, acceleration occurs after the Big Bang because of an ad hoc inflaton field. In the pre-Big Bang scenario, it happens before the bang as a natural consequence of the novel symmetries of string theory. So according to the scenario, the pre-bang universe was almost a perfect mirror image of the post-bang. If the universe is eternal into the future, it is also eternal into the past. Infinitely long ago, it was nearly empty, filled only with a tenuous, widely dispersed, chaotic gas of radiation and matter. The forces of nature, controlled by the dilaton field, were so feeble that particles in this gas barely interacted. As time went on, the forces gained in strength and pulled matter together. Randomly, some regions accumulated matter at the expense of their surroundings, and eventually the density in these regions became so high that black holes started to form. Matter inside those regions was then cut off from the outside, breaking the universe up into disconnected pieces. Inside a black hole, space and time swap roles. The center of the black hole isn't a point in space, but an instant in time. As the infalling matter approached the center, it reached higher and higher densities. But when the density, temperature, and curvature reached the maximum values allowed by string theory, these quantities bounced and started decreasing. The moment of that reversal, called a Big Bang, was later renamed a Big Bounce. Uh, the interior of one of these black holes became our universe. Not surprisingly, such an unconventional scenario has provoked a lot of controversy. Andre Lind of Stanford University has argued that for this scenario to match observations, the black hole that gave rise to our universe would have needed to be unusually large, much larger than the length scale of string theory. So an answer to this objection is that the equations predict black holes of all possible sizes. Our universe just happened to form inside a sufficiently large one. So a more serious objection argues that, it would, that matter and space-time would have behaved chaotically near the moment of the bang, in possible contradiction with the observed regularity of the early universe. Gabriella Veneziano has proposed that a chaotic state would produce a dense gas of miniature string holes, strings that were so small and massive that they were on the verge of becoming black holes. The second popular model for the pre-bang universe is so-called ekpyrotic, or conflagration, scenario. It relies on the idea that our universe sits at one end of a higher dimensional space, and a hidden brain sits at the opposite end. The two brains exert an attractive force on each other and occasionally collide, making the extra dimension shrink to zero before growing again. The Big Bang would correspond to the time of collision. So in a variant of this scenario, the collisions occur cyclically. Two brains might hit, bounce off each other, move apart, pull together again, hit again, and so on. In between collisions, the brains behave like silly putty, expanding as they recede and contracting somewhat as they come back together. During the turnaround, the expansion rate accelerates. Indeed, the present accelerating expansion of our universe may augur another collision. So the pre-bang and ekpyrotic scenarios share some common features. Both begin with a large, cold, nearly empty universe, and both share the difficult problem of making the transition between the pre- and the post-bang phase. So mathematically, the main difference between the scenarios is the behavior of the dilaton field. In the pre-bang, the dilaton begins with a low value, so that forces of nature are weak, and then steadily gain strength. And the opposite is true for the ekpyrotic scenario, in which the collision occurs when forces are at their weakest. The developers of the ekpyrotic theory initially hoped the weaknesses of forces would allow the bounce to be analyzed more easily, but they were still confronted with a difficult, high curvature situation. So the jury is still out on whether the scenario truly avoids a singularity. 
So also, the ekpirotic scenario must entail some very special conditions to solve some of the usual cosmological puzzles. So for instance, the, the brains, when they're about to collide, must have been almost exactly parallel to one another. Otherwise, the collision wouldn't have given rise to a sufficiently homogeneous bang. The cyclic version may be able to take care of this problem uh, because successive collisions would have allowed the brains to straighten themselves. So leaving aside the difficult task of fully justifying these two scenarios mathematically, physicists must also ask whether they have any observable physical consequences. For at first sight, both scenarios might seem like an exercise not in physics, but in metaphysics. Interesting ideas that observers could never prove either right or wrong. But a possible pre-Bangian epoch could have observable consequences, especially for the very small variations observed in the cosmic microwave background temperature. So first, observations show that the temperature fluctuations were shaped by acoustic waves for several hundred thousand years. The regularity of the fluctuations indicates that the waves were synchronized. So cosmologists have discarded many models over the years because they failed to account for this synchrony. But the inflationary pre-Big Bang and the ekpirotic scenarios all pass this first test. In these models, the waves were triggered by quantum processes amplified during the period of accelerating cosmic expansion. The phases of these waves were aligned. So second, each model predicts a different distribution of the temperature fluctuations with respect to angular size. Observers have found that fluctuations of all sizes have approximately the same amplitude. So discernible deviations occur only on very small scales. And for that, primordial fluctuations have been altered by subsequent processes. So we don't have to worry about that as much. Inflationary models neatly reproduce this distribution. During inflation, the curvature of space changed relatively slowly, so fluctuations of different sizes were generated under much the same conditions. In both the stringy models, the curvature evolved quickly, increasing the amplitude of small-scale fluctuations, but other processes boosted the large-scale ones, leaving all fluctuations with the same strength. For the ekpirotic scenario, those other processes involved the extra dimension of space, the one that separated the colliding brains. For the pre-Big Bang scenario, they involved a quantum field called the axion related to the dilaton. In short, all three models do match the data. Variations in temperature can arise from two distinct processes in the early universe, fluctuations in the density of matter and rippling caused by gravitational waves. Inflation involves both of these processes, whereas the pre-Big Bang and the ekpirotic scenarios involve density variations for the most part. Gravitational waves of certain sizes would leave a distinctive signature in the polarization of the cosmic microwave background radiation. So satellite and ground-based observations may be able to see that signature if it exists, and that would provide a, a really definitive test. A fourth test pertains to the statistics of the fluctuations. In inflation, the fluctuations follow a bell-shaped curve, and the same may be true in the ekpirotic case, whereas the pre-Big Bang scenario allows for a sizable deviation from such a curve. But analysis of the cosmic microwave background radiation is not the only way to verify these theories. The pre-Big Bang scenario should also produce a random background of gravitational waves in a range of frequencies that, though they're irrelevant for the microwave background, should be detectable by future gravitational wave observatories. Moreover, because the pre-Big Bang universe and the ekpirotic scenarios involve changes in the dilaton field, which is coupled to the electromagnetic field, they would both lead to large-scale magnetic field fluctuations. Vestiges of these fluctuations might show up in galactic and intergalactic magnetic fields. So when did time begin? Science doesn't have a conclusive answer yet, but at least two potentially testable theories plausibly hold that the universe, and therefore time, existed well before the Big Bang. If either scenario is right, that means the cosmos has always existed, and even if it collapses again one day, it always will exist. <laughs>